Hello and welcome to Hans Graven's Omens. I am Fred Stewart. Oh wait, <laughs> no. Over there. <laughs> welcome to a very covert, covert episode of Hans Graves and Omens, you saucy bitch. <laughs> Ooh. Big Ben, this is Rubber Ducky. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> I'm gonna steal the president's balls. Oh. Ooh. Who am I working for? It doesn't matter. The crown jewel. The money is real, though. <laughs> Taylor, you're seducing the guard up front. Yeah. I, I don't believe you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Haunts, Graves, and Omens, episode 80. Wow, we're here. It's finally happening. Um, okay, I seduced the guard with my sweet bun. <laughs> That's very true. Look at that. My name is Fred Stewart, and with me as always is my lovely co-host, Taylor. Hi. Hi, Tay. How's it going? It's going pretty good. I got the sweet spy music. <laughs> oh, sneaky. Huh. Oh. And sneaking around in the ducks in the attic is Marty Cowick. Quack, quack. <laughs> That's the signal. <laughs> Replace the president's balls. With what? Did you not? Oh my god, dude! This is all part of the plan. That's what we. That's what we. That's why we do. Whatever, dude. He's doing the signal, Tay. <laughs> Steal the hope diamond to get out of there. Oh my god. I was gonna say I don't. I don't know what the plan was. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I thought it would be nice to celebrate and bring the vibes up from last episode. Um. So, you know. We're going to just kind of just get get into it. Um, we're going to talk about the hidden world of espionage. Ooh. This episode, it's all about spies. Oh, I thought espionage was like some like prostitution shit. Dude, well, sometimes, you know. <laughs> like, what do they call that? Um, like pro escorts. Yeah, yeah. Espionage. <laughs> that's, 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 that's such a, that's, that was such a funny <laughs> bit. I'm, I'm real glad that we're... We had had that bit. Um, yeah, <laughs> I've been planning it for days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should plan harder. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, but yeah, we um, got a we got a we got a uh, four people here to talk about. Um, it's gonna be a, a super wacky, fun one. A lot of uh, spy craft shit. You know, and we're gonna go from the 1940s all the way to the modern age. Ooh. And we're not going to talk about Snowden because I feel like that's boring. That's that's fair. Not compared to at least some of these guys. Some of these guys are fucking. Look, some of these stories I'm about to tell you guys are actually insane. Like they're just really funny and they're just out of control. But uh, you guys ready to get into it? I'm ready. Uh, I'm ready. All right. First up on our list is a man known as Mo Berg. Okay. And for those of you who have listened to um, Last Podcast and Left, you probably heard this name. And uh, I want to give a big shout out to Last Podcast and Left, not that they need it. But uh, when they started talking about this guy, I was like, this guy sounds awesome. I want to look into him more. Morris Mo Berg was born uh, March 2nd, 1902. And he lived a wild life. Berg was the third and last child of Bernard Berg, a pharmacist who immigrated from Ukraine, and his wife, Rose, um, a, home, a homemaker. Both were Jewish. Uh, they lived in the Harlem section of New York City, a few blocks from the Polo Ground Stadium. When Berg was three and a half, he begged his mother to let him start school. And in 1906, Berg... Uh, uh, bought a farm. Uh, Bernard Berg, uh, his mom bought a, or his father bought a pharmacy in West Newark, and the family moved there. In 1910, the Berg family moved again to the Roseville section of Newark, New Jersey. Rose, uh, Roseville offered uh, Bernard Berg everything he wanted in the neighborhood: good schools, middle class residents, and a few Jews coming from. He's a Jewish heritage. The um, Berg began. Uh, so Mo. So not can be confused with everybody. Mo began playing baseball at the age of seven for the Roseville Methodist uh, Esacopial Church baseball team uh, under the pseudonym Runt Wolf, oh. which is a cool name, I guess. <laughs> I just I, I just put two and two together as as uh, you know how they usually name like like stadiums after baseball players. Well, yeah. there was a one in my hometown called Berg Park. I wonder if it's the same. Potentially, yeah, guy. maybe. Yeah, 
Um, but can you say Mo Morris Mo Berg five times fast? Morris Mo Mo Berg Morris Mo Berg Morris Mo Boom Boom Toy Boat Toy Boat Toy Boat <laughs> The answer is no. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Anyway, in 1918, at the age of 16, Berg uh, Mo I just say Mo uh, graduated from Behringer High School. Um, during his senior season, the New York Star, Star Eagle selected a nine-man dream team for 1918 from the city's best prep and public high school baseball players. Berg was named uh, the team's third baseman. Uh, Behringer was the first of the series of institutions where Berg religious uh, religion made him uh, unusual at the time. Most of the other students uh, were East Side Italian Catholics. Ah, forget about it! <laughs> or Protestants from the Forest Hill neighborhood. His father wanted an environment with... Um, Few Jews is what it keeps saying here. After graduating from Behringer, Berg enrolled in New York State University. He spent two and a half semesters there and also played baseball and basketball. In 1919, he transferred to Princeton University and never again referred to having any uh, having attended any NYU for a year, presenting himself exclusively as a Princeton man. Um, Berg received a. Uh, a bachelor's degree, uh, magnum cum laude in modern languages. He studied seven languages, Latin, Greek, French, Italian, Spanish, German, and Sanskrit. I can barely fucking speak English. Like, <laughs> yeah, Jesus me, me Christ. Too. That's <laughs> seven languages. It's crazy. Studying with the... Uh, was a philologist, Harold H. Bender. His Jewish heritage and uh, modest finances combined to keep him on the fringes of Princeton social life, but he never quite fit in. Uh, during his freshman year, Berg played uh, first base for an undefeated team. Beginning in his sophomore year, he started. Uh, he was starting shortstop. He, uh, he was not a great hitter and was a slow base runner. Um, but he had a strong, accurate throwing arm and sound baseball instincts. Um, in his senior year, he was the captain of the team and had a, Mar Marty, you could probably tell me if this is good or not, had a .337 batting average, batting .611 against Princeton's arch rivals, Harvard yeah, and Yale. pretty good. Pretty good? Yeah. I don't know really anything about baseball, but. It's almost like a, like a KDA, like your strikeout average as far as like what your hit is positive, you know, mm -hmm. positive, negative. So pretty good then. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Pretty good. Um, so Berg, uh, Mo, and Cr uh, Cross and Cooper, Princeton's second baseman, communicated plays in Latin when there was an opposing player on second base. So that's, that's, pre that's, that's pretty, pretty badass. Yeah. Like, yeah. Ite, go over there. I don't know. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Um, Can you speak multiple languages, Fred? Uh, I barely speak English, but I... I Kind of remember my German, but not really that well. Low key on God for real, for real. I can speak Gen Z. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking hated that. On June 26, 1923, Yale defeated Princeton 5 to 1 at Yankee Stadium to win the Big Three title. Mo had an outstanding day, getting two hits in the first four bats, two to four on a single and a double, making several mar uh, marvelous plays at shortstop. Both the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Robins, uh, the team that basically uh, became known as the Brooklyn Dodgers, started in, in, in 1932, desired, quote, Jewish blood on their teams um, to appeal to the large Jewish community in New York and express interest in, in Mo. They, they wanted they wanted Jew blood, according to history the giants i don't know why that's like such a fucking weird way to put that that is like i don't know like give us jew blood <laughs> like, like fuck man like <laughs> now they just not, say, not that he's a good baseball player but yeah now they just say diversity so yeah. like <laughs> yeah i don't know so the giants were especially interested but they already had two short stops um, who were uh, Dave Beauty Bancroft and Travis Jackson, who later became Hall of Famers. The Robins were a mediocre team on which Berg, uh, which Mo would have had a better chance to play. And on June 27, 1923, Mo signed his first big league deal for five thousand uh, dollars with the Robins, Berkeley Robins, which became the Dodgers. Right. Well, Mo later 
obviously he went pro throughout all this. He later played for the Chicago White Sox, the Cleveland Indians, the Washington Senators, and finally at the end of his career, the Boston Red Sox, ending his career in 1939. Hmm. And I'm sure you're wondering, why the fuck am I talking about baseball when I said we're talking about spies? Well, you just had to wait a couple more years until 1941. With the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese on December 7, 1941, the United States was thrust into World War II. To do his part in the war effort, Moe accepted a position with Nelson Rockefeller's Office of, Co- uh, of the Coordinator of Internal Affairs, the OIAA, on January 5, 1942. Nine days later, his father, Bernard, passed away. During the summer of 1942, Berg... Uh, screened the footage he had shot of Tokyo Bay for intelligence officers of uh, the United States military. At one time, uh, it was thought his film may have helped Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle plan his famous Doolittle raid, but the raid was conducted well before the summer of April 18, 1942, but, you know, generally believed. Uh, From August 1942 to February 1943, Moe was assigned in the Caribbean and South America. His job was to monitor the health and fitness of American troops stationed there. Uh, Moe, along with several members of the OIAA agents, left in June of 1943 because they thought South America posed little threat to the United States. They wanted to be assigned to locations where their talents would be better put to use. Now, on August 2nd, 1943, Moe accepted a position with the Office of Strategic Services Special Operations Branch also known as the OSS. The OSS, if you don't know, later turned into the CIA. Uh So uh, he accepted a position with the CIA at the time, the OSS, for a salary of $3,800 a year, uh, which is about $64,000 a year. Um, He was a paramilitary operations officer in part of the OSS that developed the present day, they said CIA, Special Activities Division. The guys who go in the country and do shit. In September, he was assigned to the OSS Secret Intelligence Branch and given a spot on the OSS SI Balkans desk. In this role, based in Washington, he remotely monitored the situation in Yugoslavia. He uh, assisted and helped prepare Slavic Americans recruited by the OSS to go on a quite a go on dangerous parachute drop into Yugoslavia. In uh, late 1943, Berg was assigned to Project Larson, a OSS operation set up by the OSS Chief of Special Operations, John Shaheen. Uh, The stated purpose of the project was to kidnap Italian rocket missile specialists in Italy and bring them to the U.S. So this was when the U.S. was really hands deep in developing uh, the Manhattan Project. Okay. So basically, they were going into, like, there, there was some other people who were going into countries like Germany and shit, and they'd be like, hey, man, they want to come work for us? You know, like, you should come work for us. And then they're basically, their whole thing is they're telling the CIA, or the OSS, the CIA operatives, basically saying, hey, get that Italian uh, rocket scientist and bring him over, and if he doesn't want to go, just shoot him. Because they're developing nuclear weapons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know? Um, another story that I didn't add into this that I, I totally forgot was that um, <laughs> when he went to Italy during this, the um, the they had already liberated uh, Italy, so like the U.S. was already within their uh, within that section, and um, they had kind of had like a USO kind of show where they had like you know these like basically like B list C list celebrities come out. And they're like, you know, like, oh, meet the troops, you know, sing you a fun song. They're like Buster Keaton and shit like that, you know, come out yeah. and be like, I'll do a wacky little dance. I'll spin around for you in my trans uh, Elliot accent. Ha 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 ha. You know, 1940s, we're here. Fucking, I'm going to spin <laughs> kick the fuck out of you. You know, shit, shit like that. And, um, well, Mo played fucking professional baseball for years. So it's not like like these guys who had watched him for years, you know, had gone to games and shit, like from Brooklyn and shit. Like they know who Mo Berg is. Yeah. yeah. So he's he's in Italy trying to like find this like this <laughs> this Italian fucking Nazi scientist, and he's just like he's like yeah we're gonna go down uh, three clicks to the west and take this rat, and they're like is that fucking Mo? Hey Mo. <laughs> Mo, Mo, I fucking love you, Mo. <laughs> hey, hey, Mo, right? And he's like, shut the book up, shut the book up, shut the book up, <laughs> shut the book up, shut up, shut up. Hey, Mo, right here, pass me the ball, Mo. 
<laughs> and then he's like, Shut the fuck up. Go fuck the devil trying to be a goddamn spy. Anyway. <laughs> dog's barking. At what? We will anyway, never know. But, um, yeah. Get back to that. So, um... The purpose was to kidnap, like I said, this Italian rocket missile specialist in Italy and bring it to the U.S. as a part of another hit, hidden project within Larson called Project Azusa, um, which had the goal of interviewing Italian physicists to learn what they knew about the Werner Heisenberg and Carl Fritz von uh, Weizsäcker, uh, the guys who were developing the nuclear arms program for Nazi Germany. Excuse me, as I almost fall out of my chair. It was similar in scope to the mission... Um, the Alsos project. Um, from May to mid-December 1944, Berg uh, hopped around Europe, interviewing physicists, trying to con uh, con convince several to leave Europe and work for the United States. At the beginning of December, news about Heisenberg um, giving a lecture in Zurich reached the OSS. Berg was assigned to attend the lecture and determine if, if, uh, if anything Heisenberg said convinced him the Germans were close to a bomb. If Mo concluded the Germans were close to a bomb, he had orders to shoot Heisenberg. <laughs> Berg uh, determined that the Germans were not close. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> on orders uh, from the direct president, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, Mo uh, persuaded our, our, our Antonio Ferry, who had served as head of the supersonic uh, research program in Italy, to relocate to the United States and take part of the supersonic aircraft development here. When Mo returned with Ferry, Roosevelt uh, commented, I see that Mo Berg is still catching very well. <laughs> Which is a very, very kind of cute little wholesome thing there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, during his time in Switzerland, Mo became friends with physicist Paul uh, Scherer. Uh, Mo uh, resigned from the OSS after the war and in, in January of 1946. Um, another thing that I didn't note that I, I, I should have put in here um, was that he was also super interested this he was a really smart guy he would actually call um so they they found like uh, oh my gosh what's his name uh, albert einstein there it is so albert einstein had to come to the u.s and he actually went and found albert einstein in the small last town and like somewhere in like new jersey or something like that and then just like called him up and was like can i come talk to you about physics <laughs> and then he went there and talked to him about physics for hours i mean if he Learned seven languages. Like he's definitely not a dumb guy. Like no, oh, yeah, and no, no, no. And it's also just super impressive that he fucking was like doing this all this covert shit, like behind the scenes, like yeah. go sneak, do do parachute drops in Yugoslavia to go find people and like watch and see what the Nazis are doing. Yeah, that's so tight. Went from being a baseball player to a spy. It's pretty badass. Pretty badass. In 1951, Berg uh, begged the CIA, which replaced the OSS, to send him to the recently founded nation of Israel. Quote, a Jew must do this, he wrote in his notebook. A Jew must do this. Oh. Which is pretty badass. The CIA rejected Mo's request, but in 1952, Berg was hired by the CIA from his old... Uh, contacts from World War II to gather information about the secret Soviet atomic bomb project. Try to say that five times fast. Secret Soviet kidding. Atomic Bomb Project. Secret Soviet Bomb Atomic Project. I would tip it that for $10,000 plus expensives that Mo <laughs> received, <laughs> the CIA received nothing. The CIA officer who spoke with Berg when he returned from New York said that he was just, quote, flaky. Oh. For the next 20 years, Mo had no real job. He lived off friends and relatives who put up with him because of his charisma. When he was asked what he did for a living, he would reply by putting his finger to his lips, giving them the impression that he was still a spy. A lifelong bachelor, he lived with his uh, brother Samuel for 17 years, according to Samuel. Berg um, became moody and snappish after the war and did not uh, care for much in life besides his books. Samuel finally grew fed up with the arrangement, asked Mo to leave when uh, having an eviction papers drawn up. Mo then moved in with his sister Ethel in Belleville, uh, Belleville, New Jersey, where he uh, resided for the rest of his life. He received handfuls of votes in the Baseball Hall of Fame, voting four in 1958 and five in 1960, and was criticized for wasting his intellectual talent on the, for the sport he loved. Mo replied, "I'd rather be playing baseball than a justice um, than a justice of the U.S. Supreme Court." Uh, Mo. Uh, received many requests to write his memoirs, but he turned them down. 
He almost began to work on them in 1960, but he quit after the co-writer assigned to work on them, confused them with Mo Howard of the Three Stooges. <laughs> oh. Oh. Ooh. And obviously later in life he passed away. Because it was a thousand years ago. Yeah. Thousand and two. Yeah. I, lo- <laughs> I just love like after all that, they're like, this dude's a fucking spy for the CIA, did all this crazy shit. And then like they're like someone who's like, oh my god, dude, like I I get to interview the guy, I got the book for the guy who was part of the three surges, and he's like, No, I was actually a spy for the US. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, Oh, boring clothes later. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what the fuck, man? You know. Next up on our list is Rudolph Abel. Buckle up, because this is gonna be a long one. Okay. I'm ready. Buckled up. <laughs> I'm buckled. Buckled. Up. Like There's anyway, I'm a rebel. Buckle. I never buckle. <laughs> it is. It's a car seat buckle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fish. So, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> uh, born William August Fisher on August 11th, 1903, in the Benwell area of Newcastle. Um, what the did you second say his first name was? Did you say born? No, born. No. He was born. Oh, his name okay. when he was born. His name was like, like Jason Bourne. No, his name was William August Fisher. He was born. Okay, okay. William August. I get it. I'm here. I promise. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, just kind of like took the wind of myself. He's the second son of Heinrich and, and Luba Fisher, uh, revolutionaries of the Tsarist era. His father was uh, of German origins, and his mother was of Russian descent. Uh, Fisher's father, a revolutionary activist, taught and agitated um, with uh, Vladimir Lenin in St. Petersburg Technological Institute. In 1896, he was arrested for, um, talking about the father, in 1896, he was arrested and sentenced to three uh, years for internal exile. Uh, as Heinrich Fischer had served three uh, sentences for offenses against the Russian imperial crown, he was forced to flee to the United Kingdom in 1901. Hmm. The alternative... Um, being deportation to Germany or imprisonment in Russia for avoidance of military service. He's like, fuck that. I'll just go to the UK. While living in the United Kingdom, uh, Fisher's father, a keen um, Bolshevik, uh, took on uh, took part in gun running, shipping arms from North England to Russia's Baltic coast. Whoa. Pretty badass. Yeah. So Fisher and his brother Henry won scholarships to the Whitley Bay High School and uh, Mount Seton High School. Uh, though Fisher was not as hardworking as Henry, he showed a lot of aptitude for science, mathematics, language, arts, and music, inherited part from his father's abilities. Encouraging their son's love of music, uh, music, Fisher's parents gave him piano lessons. He also learned to play the guitar. He started a punk band. <laughs> um, they went on tour. They went on Warp Tour. Uh, no, no, I'm just fine. I'm, no, no, that's real. But he did play <laughs> guitar um, and piano. It was during this period that Fisher developed an interest in amateur radio, uh, constructing rudimentary spark transmitters and receivers. Because he's a fucking nerd. So. <laughs> Fisher uh, became an apprentice, uh, apprentice uh, draughtsman at uh, Swan Hunter Wellsend and attended evening classes at Rutherford College before um, accepted into the London University in 1920. Uh, though Fisher qualified for university, the cost prohibited him from attending. In 1921, uh, following the Russian Revolution, Fisher's family left Newcastle uh, upon uh, time to return to Moscow. So, fluent in English, Russian, German, Polish, and Yiddish, Fisher worked for the uh, Comintern as a translator following the family's return to the Soviet Union. Trained as a radio operator, he served in the Red Army Radio Battalion in 1925 and 1926. He then worked briefly in the Radio Research Institute before being recruited by the OGPU, a predecessor of the KGB. Oh shit! Damn. In May of 1927, pretty crazy, huh? It's pretty crazy. crazy. So we're gonna we're right from the CIA to the KGB. KGB, yeah. And it's, you're gonna see the other side. So and you can speak to Yetis. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Yetish. 
Jesus Marty's 3.4 percent Jewish. She can make any sort of jokes. <laughs> but... Wow, that was fucking lame. Anyway, <laughs> I, hate that. I hate that it was so funny. Um, that year, he married um, Elena uh, Leb Lebdeva Leb Leb Lebedeva. Jesus Christ, Lebedeva. A harp student at the Moscow uh, Conservatory. They had one child together, a daughter named Evelyn, who was born on October 8th, 1929. Isn't that cute? During his interview with the OGPU, the KGB, it was determined that he should adopt a Russian-sounding name, and William August Fisher became uh, Valum <laughs> Jenkrovich Fisher. God damn, Jen Rikovich. Yeah, that lady's name that you were trying to say. Her name sounds like like a fucking medication for like high blood pressure or something. Dude, Valium, Valium, uh, Valium, Viljam, Vil, it's literally Viljam. Uh, that's what his name became. Viljam Jenkrovich Fisher. Viljam is definitely a fucking medication that makes oh, yeah. you like your hands turn into like gourds. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I just. They were like, it needs to sound more Russian, so we're going to just choose the <laughs> most Russian-sounding name. Russian. Like, we couldn't have, like, <laughs> a little bit. Like, just change his first name. What? Why does it matter? <laughs> it's so st It doesn't make any fucking sense. Anyway, <laughs> following his recruitment, he worked for the uh, KGB as a radio operator in Norway, Turkey, the United Kingdom, and France. He returned to the Soviet Union in 1936 as the head of a school that trained radio operators destined for duty in illegal residences. A little secret police action. One of the students was a Canadian-born Russian spy, Kitty Harris, who was um, she's like, um, who later <laughs> was more widely known as the spy with the seventeenth name, seventeen names. Catwoman. <laughs> the spy with seventeen names. There's Kitty. There's Harris. There's there's Harris Kitty. There's Kitty Harris. There's Fluffy. <laughs> There's Mr. Meow Meow. <laughs> <laughs> Despite his foreign birth and accusation of his brother-in-law was a uh, Trotskysk uh, Fisher, narrowly escaped the Great Purge. However, in 1938, he was dismissed from the NKVD, which the OGPU had uh, renamed uh, to in 1934 during World War II. He was again trained as radio operators from the clandestine work behind German lines having been adopted as a protege by Pavel uh, Sudoplov, uh, uh, Platov, geez, the Russian names are fucking hard, he took part in Operation uh, Shoehorn uh, in August of 1944. Uh, Sudoplatov later described this operation as the most successful radio deception game in the war, of the war. So fucking lot of radios, lot of radios we got here. Yes, my friend. Um, Fisher. <laughs> that, the my friend part was a little Middle Eastern. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a comrade. Comrade is the word I was looking for. Yeah, comrade. Yeah. Yes, comrade. Uh, Fisher's role in its operation was later rewarded in uh, what his superiors regarded as the most prestigious postings in Soviet foreign intelligence the United States. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot you were American for a second dude, until you brought that well, USA in. I'm actually technically not American. I'm a I'm a Alaskan spy. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> anyway. Uh, after rejoining the KGB in nineteen forty six, Fisher was trained as a spy for entry in the United States. In October of 1948, using a Soviet passport, he traveled from uh, Leningradsky uh, Station to Warsaw, uh, Germany, of course. In Warsaw, he discarded a Soviet passport and using a, a U.S. passport, traveled from Czechoslovakia and Switzerland to Paris. His new passport bore the name Andrew Coitus. Coitus. Coitus? Yes. Hello, my name is Andrew Coyotes. <laughs> it would have been better if his, his name was Andrew Coitus. Yeah. Yeah, that would be. That would, it's, a, it's a good bit. Unless I thank you. <laughs> it's the first of Fisher's false identities. The real Andrew uh, Coyotes was a Lithuanian born and had been an American citizen after migrating to the United States. Um, so Coyotes had, had applied for and received a visa to visit the Soviet Union. However, the Soviets uh, retained his passport, which Fisher eventually used. Oh. So the real uh, Coyotes had been in poor health and died while visiting relatives in Lithuania. Fisher, uh, as this Coyotes 
uh, then traveled aboard the RMS Cynthia from Le Havre, France, to North America, disembarking in Qu Quebec. Um, still uh, using Kyoto's passport, he went to Montreal and crossed the United States on November 7th. Hmm. So, on November 26th, Fisher met with illegal, uh, Soviet illegal uh, Joseph Romovich Gudovich, <laughs> Grigulovich, that's a fucking crazy name. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it looks like someone sneezed on the alphabet. Um, Codename Max or Arthur. Um, Arthur, I'm just gonna say Arthur, gave Fisher uh, a genuine birth certificate, a forged uh, a forged draft card, and a forged tax certificate, all under the name of Emil Robert Goldfuss, along with a thousand dollars. After handling uh, after handing back uh, Cortez's passport and documents, Fisher assumed the name Goldfuss. Um, his code name was Mark. The real Goldfuss had died only. Uh, at only 14 months, having been born in August 2nd, 1902 in New York. Goldfuss's uh, birth certificate was obtained by the NKVD uh, at the end of the Spanish Civil War when the center would uh, collect identity documents from the International Brigade's members um, uh, for use in espionage operations. So they're basically just grabbing fucking people's documents who had died and been like, they're not actually dead. Let's just go put that somewhere else. Oh. So a lot of espionage going on yeah. right now. And... July of 1949, Fisher met with a, a legal, uh, with a quote legal KGB resident from the Soviet Consulate General, uh, who provided him with money. Shortly afterwards, Fisher was ordered to reactivate the volunteer. It's in quotations, volunteer network to smuggle atomic secrets to Russia. Damn. Mm hmm. Uh, members of the network had stopped uh, cooperating after post war security was tightened at Los Alamos. Do you guys know what Los Alamos is? Oh, yeah. Tay? Yep. This is the Alamo? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't fucking know, man. <laughs> Los Alamos was the main area where the nuclear bomb was being uh, made. Oh, okay. Like that was the main the research Mexico. area, Los Alamos. I don't uh, know. It's a it's a city in New Mexico or a town. <laughs> yes. So Lona Cohen, codenamed Leslie, and her husband Mo Morris Cohen, uh, codenamed Lewis, and Volunteer, had run the Volunteer Network and were seasoned couriers. Theodore Ted Hall, codenamed M. Lad, a physicist, uh, sorry, physicist, was the most important agent in the network in 1945, passing atomic secrets from Los Alamos to the Russian government. The volunteer network grew uh, to include Aiden and Serb nuclear, nuclear physicists uh, contacted by Hall and uh, Silver Fisher, sorry, and Silver Fisher. Uh, there's a lot of information here, sorry, it's, it's kind of fucking a lot to read. Fisher uh, spent most of his first year organizing his network when he was, uh, while it was not known for... Um, certain where Fisher uh, went or what he did is believed that he traveled to Santa Fe, New Mexico, then collected, and th then the, the, the collection point for the stolen diagrams of the Manhattan Project, he fucking took those. Kitty Harris, a former uh, pupil of Fisher's, had spent a year in Santa Fe during the war where she passed secrets from physicists to couriers. Uh, during this period, Fisher uh, received the Order of the Red Banner, an important Soviet medal normally reserved for military personnel. Hmm. In 1950, Fisher's illegal residency was endangered by the arrest of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, uh, for whom uh, Lona Cohen had been a courier. Those were actually people I was actually going to cover in this episode. Um, maybe we'll do later on, but it's another interesting spy story. The Cohens were quickly um, spirited to Mexico before moving on to um, Moscow. They uh, were to resurface the United, United Kingdom using identities of Peter and Helen Kroger. Fisher was relieved when the Rosenbergs did not disclose any information about him to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, but the arrest heralded a bleak outlook for his new spy network. However, on October 21st, 1952, as instructed by Moscow, Reno Hehanvian, that's a fucking crazy name, had left a thumbtack on a signpost in New York's Central Park. The thumbtack signaled Fisher that um, Hehan, hey, Jesus Christ, hey, 
Hannon, uh, his new assistant, had arrived. Codename Vic uh, had arrived in New York on the RMS Queen Mary, which we've covered in an episode before, uh, back when it was actually still operating, which is insane. That's crazy. Uh, Under the uh, alias Eugene Nikolai Maki, the real Maki had been born in the United States to a Finnish-American father and a New York mother in 1919. In 1927, the family had migrated to Estonia. In 1948, the KGB had called Heihanen to Moscow, where they had issued him a new assignment. In 1949, Heihanen uh, freely obtained Maki's birth certificate. He had spent three years in Finland taking over Maki's identity. Pretending to him, he would go to the store, he'd get his balls trimmed, whatever he needed to do to maintain his identity. What? Spy craft. Spy craft. <laughs> Spy craft. Get in there and you got to get in there deep. Oh. <laughs> One of those things is not like the other that was listed. Spy craft. No. <laughs> After arriving in New York, Hey Hanan um, spent ne- like the next two years establishing his identity. And during this time, he received money from his superiors left in uh, dead, dead litter boxes in the Bronx in Manhattan. Um, you know, you know, what dead drops are guys. Uh, I think so. Uh, so these are like basically they would basically take an items or like documents and shit and dead drop them. Like they would go to like say like in said Proxy Manhattan, they'd go to like Central Park and be like, at this time, at this date, go to this bench and look underneath the bench. Yeah, oh, okay, they'd go yeah, there, yeah. They'd, they'd find like money. That's or, what I thought it was. Yeah. I just didn't know what it was called. Or they'd switch suitcases and shit like that. Your briefcases, you know, pretty yeah. pretty spy stuff. <laughs> uh. It is known he occasionally drew attention to himself by indulging in heavy drinking sessions and heated arguments with his Finnish wife, Hannah, which I think is really funny because uh, he's just like, <laughs> and she's like, you never fucking home. You're never here. And he's like, I'm a spy for the Russian government. <laughs> I got a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, you're a fucking spy. It's like, so you're no, I know I'm not. You're a spy. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, your name's not even, you're not even the real fucking guy, man. You don't even know. So for six months, <laughs> Hannon checked uh, the thumbtack, and no one had made contact. He also checked the uh, dead drop locations he had memorized. There, he found a hollowed out nickel. However, prior to opening the coin, Hannon had misplaced it either buying a newspaper with it or uh, using it as a subway token. Because... <laughs> nice. Oh, no. What a fucking spy, bro. Oh, what a spy. No. Yeah. Th- this reminds me... He didn't, like, check your coins and put it in a special spot. He was just like, I'm going to put that with all the rest of my coins. <laughs> that just reminds me. There, there was a movie that came out a couple of years ago where a guy was, like, um, his company was being investigated by the FBI for, like, like fraud or something like that. Like multi million dollars, and the guy was like basically stupid. But it's based off a real story where he had a recorder inside of a briefcase, and like he he opened it during the meeting, and then like had they had like a false top, and like he opened the top and was like tapping on the microphone and shit, and then would close it, and somehow nobody noticed. <laughs> but like there was like there's so many quotes in that movie. But my favorite, it goes, it goes, they call me 0014 because I'm twice as smart as 007. <laughs> and that's the same vibe I'm getting from this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so for the next seven months, the hollow nickel traveled around New York City economy unopened. The trail of the hollow nickel ended up when uh, a 13 year old newsboy was collecting uh, for his weekly deliveries. The newsboy accidentally dropped the nickel and it broke in half. Uh, revealing a micro photograph containing a series of numbers. Oh, shit. Ooh. The newsboy handed the nickel to New York City detective, who then uh, forwarded it to the FBI and was like, what's this? And he was like, mind your own fucking business. What is it? And like, you know, looked at it. Gabagool. Uh, <laughs> and then from 1953 to 1957, uh, though every effort was made to decipher the mini, uh, micro photograph, the FBI was unable to solve the mystery. They just put it in the newspaper, and he's like, "Ah, oh, perfect." Yeah, he's <laughs> That's like, what "I needed." <laughs> like, uh, nickel's fucking weird. Right, we'll just go buy another paper with it. See if we get more. In late 1953, Fisher moved to Brooklyn and rented a room in a boarding house on Hick Street. Um, he rented a fifth floor studio in the Ovington Studios building on Fulton Street. Since he was posing as an artist and photographer, nobody questioned his irregular working hours and frequent uh, disappearances. 
over his uh, over time, his artistic technique improved, and he became a quite uh, became a competent painter. Though he disliked abstract painting and preferred more conventional styles. Hmm. Sort of painting, isn't it? Look at this guy. <laughs> Um, he mingled with New York artists who were surprised by his admiration for the Russian painter Isaac uh, Leviton. Uh, although Fisher was careful not to discuss Stalinist socialist uh, uh, realism, excuse me, as I burp into the mic, the only <coughs> the only visitors to Fisher's studio were artist friends who he had felt safe from suspicion. In particular, he became friends with Burton Silverman. Um, Fisher uh, sometimes, sorry, Fisher sometimes related made up, uh, made up stories of previous lives as a Boston accountant, a lumberjack in the Pacific Northwest, et cetera, et cetera. Because yes, it was a lumberjack in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> it's like, are you sure you're not a Russian spy? It's, it's absolutely positive. <laughs> I believe him. So, a little fast forward again, Ed, 1954. Uh, the guy with the really crazy name, Hey Han and then Hey Han, began working as Fisher's assistant. He was to deliver a report from the Soviet agent, sorry, from a Soviet agent to the United Nations, to a dead litter box for collection. Right. However, the report never arrived. Oh. Fisher was disturbed by Hanan's lack of work ethics and his obsession with alcohol. In the spring of 1955, Fisher and Hanan visited Bear Mountain Park and buried $5,000 uh, destined for the wife of a Soviet spy, Morton Sobel, who in 1951 was sentenced to 30 years in jail. In 1955, Fisher, exhausted by the constant pressure, returned to Moscow for six months of rest and recuperation, leaving Hanan in charge. <laughs> Bad idea. Yeah, he's like, hey, <laughs> boss, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be fine. No one's gonna know I'm a Russian spy. <laughs> no, listen, if anybody asks I'm a Russian spy, I'm gonna say no. I don't believe you. No, listen, if anybody asks, they're gonna, I'm gonna tell them no. Like, watch, somebody ask me. Are you a Russian spy? Oh, Are fuck, you a Russian oh, shit. Spy, oh my god, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so while in Moscow, Fisher uh, informed his superiors of the dissatisfaction with Hayhannon. Upon his return to New York in 1956, he found that his carefully constructed network had been left to disintegrate in his absence. Surprise, surprise. Surprise. Fisher uh, checked on his drop points only to find messages several months old why Hayhannon's radio transmissions had been routinely been sent from the same location using incorrect radio frequencies. The money Hannon received from the KGB to support the network was instead spent on alcohol and prostitutes. <laughs> Can't say I'm fucking surprised. Yeah. yeah. Like, what did you expect to happen when you leave the man who you're like, <laughs> I don't really like his worth ethic. Like, he's, I don't know. He's not very good at his job, yeah. which is being a Russian spy. So you feel like he should be good at his job, but he's not. He's not. But I'm going to leave him in charge. I'm going to leave him in charge. You'll be all right. Um, by early 1957, Fisher had lost patience with Hannon and demanded that Moscow recall his deputy. In January 1957, Hannon received a message from Moscow promoting him to lieutenant colonel and granting him leave to the Soviet Union. Upon hearing he was to return to Moscow, Hannon was fearful that he'd be uh, severely disciplined or even executed. He handed fabricated stories to justify his delay, claiming that Fisher, that the FBI had taken him off the RMS Queen Mary. Fisher, unsuspecting, advised to Hannon to leave the U.S. immediately to avoid FBI surveillance and handed him $200 for travel expenses. Prior to departure, Hannon uh, returned to Bear Mountain Park and retrieved the buried $5,000 for his own use. Oh. Hey, Hannon arrived in Paris on May Day, uh, having sailed from the U.S. aboard the La Liberté. Uh -huh. <laughs> Making contact with KGB residency, he received another $200 for his journey to Moscow. Four days later, instead of uh, continuing his journey to the Soviet Union, he entered the American embassy in Paris, announcing that he was... A KGB officer and asking for asylum. <laughs> of fucking oh, of course he did. <laughs> Literally, 
<laughs> yeah. Not not a good Russian spy at all. No, no he's like terrible. He's like, he just like like fucking. They're like just like typing. They're like oh, Paris was nice this time of year. It's like yeah. It's like yeah. It's, it's no, you know, it's no Monskiki, New York, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's pretty fine. You know, there's a lot of the weather's really interesting out there. And I'm the, a Russian spy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Doors fly open. He's just like. Hello. <laughs> like, oh, you drunk? He's like, it is me, uh, a Russian spy. Uh, uh, yes. I'm, I'm a little bit drunk. Not going to lie to you. I'm a little bit, a little bit of a drinky boom. And they're like, okay. He's like, MKGB agent. <laughs> Give me asylum, please. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, all right. Well, uh, when Heihan had announced himself to the embassy on May 4th, he appeared drunk. <laughs> <laughs> as, I, as I was making the joke, the CIA, uh, Central Intelligence Agency, officials at Paris Embassy did not find Hannon's story credible. Uh, they were not convinced that he might actually be a Russian spy until he produced a hollow Finnish five mark coin. <laughs> <laughs> Even the American Embassy didn't, or the, the CIA. The CIA is like, this, this guy's just hammered, bro. Like, like, they're like, he's just a fucking drunk. Yeah, he's like, I am Russian spy. <laughs> Believe me, I am fucking drunk. I, I tell you so many Soviet secrets, and they're like, I don't what the fuck. They're like, here's the first problem. Here, check You're out, drunk. Check out this fucking cool coin I got. <laughs> and they're like, all right. So, like, yeah. The first problem is like, He's a Russian and he's drunk. Like yeah, yeah. those two things right there don't usually mesh. So mm-hmm. I don't fucking believe you. No, the stereotype of Russians being drunk is definitely not a thing. It's like it's like <laughs> Irish people drinking. It's not a real thing. <laughs> um. So upon opening the coin, uh, a square, a microfilm was revealed. Surprise, surprise. On May 11th, the CIA returned to the United States and handed him over to the FBI. <laughs> they go, here you go, stupid. Uh, as a member of the Soviet spy ring operating on American soil, he Hannon uh, came under the FBI's jurisdiction and they began verifying his story. They go, where did you come from? He goes, Russia. And they go, what are you doing here? Spying. They go, we believe him. So upon his arrival in the United States, he Hannon um, was interrogated by the FBI and proved very cooperative. Surprise. He admitted his first Soviet contact in New York had been uh, Mikhail, and upon um, being shown a series of photographs, the Soviet officials identified Mikhail as Mikhail uh, Servin. Uh, sorry, Serv Irvin. Serv Irvin. So, yeah, it's, it's a Russian name. It's like it's all over the place. Uh, Mikhail, however, had returned to Moscow two years previously. The FBI then turned its attention to um, Mikhail's replacement. Uh, hey, Hannon was able only to provide Fisher's code name, Mark, and a description of him. He was, however, able to tell the FBI about Fisher's studio and its location. Hey, Hannon was also able to solve the mystery of the hollow nickel, which the FBI ha- had been unable to decipher for four years. <laughs> I, I like that the code name is, is Mark, because it's just like... <laughs> <laughs> What's his name? Mark. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, all right. Who's our Mark? Yeah. All right. We don't fucking believe you. Yeah, like, I, what, what's, what's his code name? Steve. Yeah. Like, like, who's next? Dale. Yeah, like, shit. It doesn't fucking Bob. make sense. It's, Hello, brother. My name is Dale. I am uh, definitely, <laughs> definitely from uh, Chattanooga. Uh, definitely from the south. Definitely not Russian KGB agent nah. trying to integrate myself into NASCAR. Never. <laughs> <laughs> so the KGB did not discover uh, Hey Hannon's defection until August, although it was more likely they uh, notified Fisher earlier when Hey Hannon failed to arrive in Moscow. As a precaution, Fisher was ordered to leave the United States. But escape was complicated because if Mark had been uh, com- compromised by Hey Hannon, Fisher's other identities could have been compromised as well. Fisher could not leave the country as Martin Colonis, uh, Emil Goldfuss, or even the long forgotten Andrew Kayotis. The KGB Center, with help from the KGB Ottawa's resident, set uh, about uh, procuring, uh, procuring two new passports for Fisher in the names of Robert Callan and Vasali uh, <laughs> Dozogel. That's a fucking crazy name. Um, but this process would take time. The Canadian Communist Party uh, succeeded in obtaining a new passport for Fisher in the name of Robert uh, Callan. Fisher, however, was arrested before he could adopt his new identity and leave the United States. Oh, shit. So, 
April 1957. Somewhere in the United States, probably. <laughs> probably. 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 <laughs> Fisher told his artist friends he was going south on a seven week vacation. Less than three weeks later, acting on Hey Hannon's information, surveillance was established near Fisher's uh, studio, uh, photo studio on, on May 28th, 1957, in a small park opposite of Fulton Street. FBI agents spotted a man acting nervously. From time to time, the man got up, walked around, and eventually left. The FBI agents were convinced he fit the description of Mark. The surveillance continued on, quote, Mark, and on the night of June 13th, a light was seen to go on in Fisher's studio at 10 p.m. On June 15th, 1957, Hayhannon was showed a photograph of Fisher taken by the FBI with a hidden camera. Hayhannon confirmed that it was Mark on the photograph. Hey, Hannon's a snitch. He is a snitch. Got a little double agent action. Once the FBI had possibly a positive identification, they stepped up surveillance, following Fisher from his studio to the Hotel uh, Lotham. Fisher was aware of the tale, but uh, as he had no passport to leave the country, he devised a plan to uh, use uh, upon his departure. Excuse me. My brain's like fogging up. Fisher decided that he would uh, n- he would not turn uh, traitor. Uh, sorry, he would not turn traitor as Hey Hannon did, um, because he s- was still trusted. Uh, he still trusted the KGB and knew that if he cooperated with the FBI, he would not see his wife or his daughter again. And then on uh, June twenty first, nineteen fifty seven, at seven a.m., Fisher answered a knock on the door to his room, room eight thirty nine. Upon opening the door, he was confronted by two FBI agents who addressed him as Colonel and stated that they had information concerning his involvement in espionage. Oh, shit. Time's up, fucker. Fisher knew that the FBI would use his rank and... Um, sorry, Fisher knew the FBI would use his rank and could have only come from Hay Hannon. Fisher said nothing to the FBI. After spending 23 minutes staring at Fisher, the FBI agents called in the waiting immigration and neutra- naturalization services, a service officer who arrested Fisher and detained him under section, section uh, 242 of the Immigration National Securities Act. Oh, sorry. Immigration and Nationality Act. Excuse me. You're a spy. We got you, bitch. Fisher <laughs> was... <laughs> I like that it took 23 minutes for them just staring at him. He's not saying a word. It's just and they're like, we know you're a spy! You're a fucking filthy spy! And he's just like... Like... <laughs> just, just dead silent. He's like, yes, and... Fisher was then flown uh, to the Federal Alien Detention Facility in, in McAllen, Texas, and was held for six weeks. During this period, Fisher stated that his real name was Rudolf uh, Ivanich Abel, and that he was a Soviet citizen although he refused to discuss his intelligence activities. The name Rudolf Ivanich Abel was that of a deceased friend and KGB colonel. Fisher uh, knew as soon as the center saw uh, the name Abel on the front pages of American newspapers, they'd realize that he had been captured. Oh. Smart, smart, smart. During Fisher's detainment, the FBI had begun searching his hotel room and photo studio where they discovered espionage equipment, including shortwave radios, cipher pads, cameras, and film for producing microdots, a hollow shaving brush, and numerous trick containers, including hollowed out bolts. You heard it. Every camera ever is involved in espionage. Right. Sorry, photographers. Yeah. We're yeah. on to yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, the camera that's filming this is part of used for espionage. Mm-hmm. In Fisher's New York hotel room, the FBI found $4,000, a hollow uh, ebony block containing a 2,500-page Russian code book, a hollow pencil containing encrypted messages on a microfilm, and a key to a safe deposit box containing another $15,000 in cash. Goddamn. Yeah. Also discovered were photographs of co- the Coheans and a and recognition phrases uh, to establish contact between agents who had never met before. So, dude's pretty pretty boned. As Fisher was no longer considered an alleged uh, illegal alien, but rather an alleged spy, he was flown to tex- from Texas to New York on August 7, 1957, to answer the indictment. Fisher was subsequently indicted uh, to stand trial as a Russian spy. 
The Brooklyn Bar Association approached several prominent uh, prominent tr- uh, trial lawyers with political ambitions, all of whom declined the case. <laughs> Nobody wanted it. They then contacted James B. Donovan um, because he had served as a wartime counsel in the Office of Strategic Services, the CIA, you know, the fucking yeah. OSS turned the CIA and had years of courtroom experience. The Bar Association believed Donovan was uh, uniquely qualified to act as Fisher's defense lawyer. At Donovan's initial meeting with Fisher, the latter accepted Donovan as his uh, defense counsel. Donovan was subsequently um, brought um, brought in attorney Thomas M. Uh, Deb, Deb Vasi to assist him. Uh, Fisher was uh, tried in a federal court in New York City during October 1957 on three counts. Count one being conspiracy to transmit defense information to the Soviet Union, which is a 30-year imprisonment. Conspiracy to obtain defense information, which is 10 years imprisonment. And conspiracy to act in the United States as an agent of a foreign government without notification to the Secretary of State. Five years imprisonment. So like 45 years. Yes. 45 years is what he's looking at. Hannon, Fisher's former assistant, testified against him in trial, which is a fucking bold thing to do, bro. You, you, you win against the KGB. That's a bold thing to do. Yeah. yeah. The prosecution uh, failed to find any other alleged members of Fisher's spy network, if there were any. The judge uh, retired. Um, the jury retired for three and a half. Sorry. Excuse me. The jury retired for three and a half hours and returned on the afternoon of October 25th, 1957, finding Fisher. Guilty in all three counts. Yeah, obvious. Um, And on November 15, 1957, the judge uh, Mortimer uh, W. Byers imposed on Fisher the total sentence of 30 years in fines with $3,000. In Abel versus the United States, the United States Supreme Court upheld his conviction by a vote of five to four. Hmm. Um, Fisher, a Rudolph Ivanish Abel, was able to serve his sentence as a uh, prisoner of the Atlanta uh, Federal Penitentiary in Georgia. He occupied himself with painting, learning silk screening, playing a chest, and writing uh, uh, was it logo thematic tables as a sheer enjoyment. Um, he became friends with two other convicted Soviet spies. Uh, one of these was Morton Sobel, whose wife had failed to receive $5,000 and embezzled by Hay Hannon. The other prisoner was Kurt uh, Pogner, an Austrian who had been sent to conspiracy to commit espionage. So, did Hay Hannon serve any time? Is my question. Like, well, I don't think so. I think they kind of just like let him go. Um, but <laughs> Fisher served just over four years for his sentence, and on February 10, 1962, he was exchanged in a, uh, for the shot down American U two pilot Francis Gary Powers. Oh. The exchange took place in. Uh, on the uh, sorry, Glennick Glen, Bridge um, that linked West Berlin to Potsdam, which became famous during the Cold War as the Bridge of Spies. Um, at precisely the same time, at Checkpoint Charlie, Frederick Pryor was released by the East German uh, Stasi into the waiting arms of his father. A few days later, Fischer uh, reunited with his wife Elena and his daughter Evelyn and flew home. Uh, for the sake of his own reputation, it suited the KGB to portray Abel's nine years of being an uh, undetected agent in the United States as a triumph and a dedicated K- uh, NKVD member. Hmm. The myth about the master spy Rudolf Abel replaced his identity of Fisher's illegal residency, even as the party hierarchy was uh, well aware that Fisher had achieved nothing of real significance. During <laughs> uh, during his eight years as an illegal uh, resident, he appears to have not recruited or even identified a single potential agent. Classic. Uh, after his return to Moscow, Fisher was employed by the Illegals Doctrine of the KGB's first chief doctorate, uh, giving speeches and lecturing school children on intelligence work, but later be- uh, became un- increasingly delusional or disillusioned, excuse me. He uh, made a notable appearance in the forward of the Soviet spy film Dead Season and also worked as a consultant on the film. Fisher, who was a heavy smoker, died of lung cancer on November 5th, 15th, 1971. His ashes were uh, interred at the uh, Donskoy Cemetery under his real name. 
next to um, Conan Moldy, uh, Mol- Mol- Molody, who had died years prior. A few Western correspondents were invited uh, they were, uh, to view themselves, uh, their true identity of a spy who never broke. Um, honestly, I personally feel like uh, Hey Hannon probably would have been safer in a prison than he would have been just on the streets. Yeah, I mean... I mean, like, yes, there's, like, Soviet spies in prisons, but also <laughs> there's a lot more on the streets. Yeah, dude would have come up just, like, blowing fucking anthrax into his face. He yeah, like, he, he was not a smart man. Kai Hannon like, just kind of disappeared after all that. and was like, we're just going to put you somewhere. Like... He's, he now goes by the name of Martin Cowick. Uh, I am not Martin Cowick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know. <laughs> hey, Hannon. <laughs> so next up on our list is John Anthony Walker. Uh, no James Bonds on this list, well, except for maybe Moberg. I mean, he's like only one, only one so far that like makes any sort of difference. That's like this guy's fucking badass, dude. Yeah, yeah. Everyone else is kind of kind of shitty. Uh, so Walker was born in Washington D.C. on July twenty eighth, nineteen thirty seven. Did high school in Scranton, or Sc- Scranton, Pennsylvania. You know, Aww. little office the action. Office. Yeah. Mm-hmm. After dropping out of high school, Walker and his friends staged a series of burglaries on May 27, 1955. Their loot included, get ready, uh, two tires, four quarts of oil, six cans of cleaner, and the whole $3 in cash. Oh, my God. Big they brain. Were, they Big got brain. away with so much. Dude, it's like the fucking like United California Bank Heist, but better. <laughs> um so the pair evaded police during a high-speed chase, but were arrested two days later. <laughs> yeah. The, he was offered the option of jail time or the military, and in 1955, he enlisted with the Navy <laughs> and successfully advanced as a radio man to a chief petty officer in eight years. He was stationed in Boston. Walker met and married Barbara Crowley, and they had four children together, three daughters and a son. While stationed at the nuclear-powered uh, fleet uh, ballistic missile uh, submarine, the USS Andrew Jackson, in um, Charleston, South Carolina, Walk- Walker opened a bar, uh, which failed to turn profit and immediately plunged him into debt. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like, I'll open a bar, and then just, just like straight in the dirt. Um, in 1965, Walker transferred uh, to the newly built uh, FBM USS Simon uh, Bolivier, uh, where he was, where he received a top secret crypto clearance to work in the submarines communication spaces. He and other members of the submarines communications teams were members of the John Birch Society, uh, distributing li- literature about the organization to crew members and to friends ashore. Where Walker attempted the Playboy lifestyle. He's like, I got a wife, four kids, time to do a Playboy lifestyle. Yeah, of baby. Course, yes. You know what I'm saying? Fucking out here, just drinking my alcohol. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. So John Walker was promoted to warrant officer in March of 1967, and in April was assigned as a communications watch officer at the headquarters of the Combosant in Norfolk, Virginia, um, where his responsibilities included running the entire communication center for the submarine force. It's a lot of a lot of a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah. Walker began spying for the Soviets in late 1967. It oh. didn't take that long to flip. Nope. Yeah. When uh, distraught over his financial difficulties, he walked into the old Soviet embassy in Washington D.C., sold a top secret document, a radio a cipher card for several thousand dollars and negotiated an ongoing salary of $500 uh, to uh, $1,000 a week. So, pretty wild. Soviet KGB General Boris... Oh, dude, what the fuck? (laughs) Soviet KGB General Boris Alec Sankrovich Solomontin um, quote, played a key role in handling of in the handling of John Walker. Walker justified his treachery by claiming that the first uh, classified Navy communications data he sold to Soviets had already been completely compromised when the North Koreans had captured the U.S. Navy communications uh, surveillance ship USS Pueblo. Yet the Koreans captured a Playbo in, a playbo in uh, late 1968, uh, many weeks after Walker had uh, betrayed um, the information. So, <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah. 
Furthermore, a 2001 thesis uh, presented at the U.S. Army Command and General St uh, Staff College using information obtained from the Soviet archives from Oleg uh, Kalogin uh, indicated that Pueblo, that the Pueblo incident may have only taken place because of the Soviets wanted to study equipment um, described in the documents supplied to them by Walker. Um, it has been emerged in the recent years that North Korea acted alone and the incident um, actually harmed North Koreans' relations with most of the Eastern Bloc. Oh. Yeah, they're like, why would you do that? And they're like, it's, I'm taking it. And they're like, why? Stop that. Stop doing that. <laughs> in the spring of 1968, John Walker's wife discovered items in his desk at home, causing her to suspect that he was acting as a spy. Which is like... Hmm, let's see, there's a... There's a camera There's a camera. start. There's a camera, there's a zip line, there's night vision goggles, there's a climbing harness, there's like this tape, and plays it, and just like spy music. <laughs> Are you a fucking spy? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Walker continued uh, spying, uh, receiving an income for several thousand dollars per month for spying on classified information. Walker used most of the spy money to pay off his uh, delinquent debts and move his family into a better neighborhood. But he also set aside some of it for future investment, such as turning around the fortune uh, fortunes of his uh, money losing bar by hiring a skilled bartender. While Walker occasionally used the services of his wife, Barbara Walker, he anticipated the possibility of losing access due to reassignment. Walker's chance uh, to seek further assistance came in September of 1969 when he became the deputy director of the Radioman A and B schools in the Naval Training Center in San Diego, California. Oh. There, Walker befriended student Jerry Whitworth. So, um, Jerry Whitworth, excuse me, I was hoping to have this up. So, Jerry Whitworth um, later would later be arrested for spy crimes as well. Oh. Um, so Walker was transferred from San Diego um, in December 1971 to become the communications officer aboard the supply ship USS Niagara Falls. Whitworth, who uh, would become a Navy Superior Chief Petty Officer, Senior uh, Chief Radioman, agreed to help Walker gain access to a highly classified communications data in 1973 and served aboard the Niagara Falls after w Walker retired from the Navy. Uh, transfer to the staff of the commander of the um, uh, amphibious force Atlantic Fleet had stopped Walker's uh, access to the data the Soviets wanted, but he recruited Whitworth to keep the data flowing, softening the idea of espionage by telling him that the data was going to Israel, an ally of the United States. Oh. Later, when Whitworth realized that the data was actually going to the Soviets instead, of Israel, he nonetheless continued to <laughs> supply Walker with the information until Whitworth's retirement from the Navy in 1983. <laughs> yeah. He was like, I don't know how I feel about this. I feel like it's pretty... I like, like how... Sketchy. <laughs> yeah. It's I like, like, no, it's going to Israel. I, well, I like how he's like, he's like, hey, it's going to Israel. They're our friends. That's why I'm getting the documents. They're like, huh, do you think that like we would like have a bunch of people and they'd be like, yeah, we're just going to like take it instead of like you having to smuggle it out. And he's like, <laughs> it's fine. So. <laughs> and then they're like, actually, it's going, going, to, it's going to the Russians. And they're like, oh, the oh my God, it's going to the Russians. And they're like, yeah. And they're like, oh, here you go. Oh, whatever. Yeah. Whatever. I don't give a shit anymore. Yeah. So in 1976, Walker retired from the Navy in order to give up um, his security clearance as uh, he believed the certain superior officers of his were too keen on investigating lapses in his records. Walker and Barbara also, ha also divorced. <laughs> However, Walker uh, did not end his espionage. He began working, uh, been looking for uh, more aggressively among his children and family members for assistance. Walker was a private investigator during this time. Uh, by 1984, he had recruited his older brother, Arthur James Walker, a retired lieutenant commander who served from 1953 until 1973 and then went on to work as a military contractor, and his son, Michael Law uh, Lance Walker, an active duty seaman since 1982. Walker had... Uh, you said seaman. <laughs> seaman, uh, I get it. <laughs> you said duty and seaman right next to each other. Dude, active duty seaman. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so stupid. <laughs> so stupid. Walker had also attempted to recruit his <laughs> youngest daughter, who had been enlisted by the United States Army, but she cut her military career short when she became pregnant and refused for, uh, her father's offer to pay for an abortion instead of deciding to devote herself to a full-time motherhood. Good for her. She's like, I'm not going to be part of your fucking spy ring. <laughs> He's like, just get rid of the fucking baby. You can be a spy. <laughs> She's like, what the fuck? No, I'm not doing that. That's fucking insane. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, what? Like have a kid and like lose my kid and then go to prison? Yeah, that sounds awesome, dude. No, I'm not doing that. Walker then uh, turned his attention to his uh, son, who had, uh, who had drifted during much of his teenage years and dropped out of high school. Walker gained custody of his son, put him to work as an apprentice at his detective agency in order to prepare him for espionage and encourage him to re-enroll in high school to earn his diploma and re-enlist in the Navy. I'm sorry, then, then to enlist in the Navy, not re-enlist. When Walker began spying, he worked as a key su supervisor in the communication center of the U.S. Uh, Atlantic Fleet Submarine Force. Uh, and he had uh, knowledge of top secret technologies, such as the SOSIS underwater surveillance system, which tracks underwater acoustics via network of submerged hydrophones. Uh, hydrophones. Oh. Got microphones under the ocean. Ooh. Damn. It's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, it was the it was the Walker the, um it was sorry. It was uh Walker that the it was, Jesus Christ, my brain's falling apart. Um it was uh, through Walker that the Soviets became aware the U.S. was able to track the location of Soviet submarines by the uh, cavitation uh, produced by the propellers. After this, the propellers of the Soviet submarines were improved to re uh, reduce that. So, like, they couldn't hear the subs anymore underwater. The Toshiba Konsberg scandal was discovered in, the, in this activity in 1989. It uh, also alleged that Walker's actions participated in the seizure of the USS Pueblo. CIA historian H. Keith Melton uh, states that the uh, states on the show Top Secrets of the CIA, which aired on the military channel, among other occasions, in February 5th, 2013. Um, the Soviets had intercepted our coded messages that had never been, uh, they had never been able to read them. And with Walker providing code cards, uh, this was one half of what they needed to read the messages. The other half that they needed were the machines themselves. The, wa the Walker could give them repair manuals. He couldn't give them the machines. So within a month, John Walker volunteered services. The Soviets arranged um, through the Korean North Koreans to hijack the U.S. Navy ship uh, with its cipher machines. That was the USS Puebla. Uh -oh. Um in early of 1968, they captured the Pueblo and took it to Wonsan Harbor, then quickly took the machines off and flew them to Moscow. Jeez. Now, Moscow had both parts of the puzzle, and the they had the machine that they, um, and they had the American spy in place in Norfolk uh, with the code cards and access to them. Oh my goodness, I just lost everything. Excuse me. I hate when it does that, when I it jumps when it... all the way to the fucking top. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Where is it gone? Yeah. yeah. Right there. We're good. So, in 1990, the New York Times journalist uh, John J. O'Connor, John J. O'Connor, reported that it had, been it had been estimated by the intelligence officers, intelligence experts, that Mr. Walker had provided enough cold data information to alter significantly the balance of the power between Russia and the United States. <laughs> the power of Russian compels you. No, the power of the Russian compels you. <laughs> <laughs> Slinging vodka in your ass. Uh, oh. Father Mick shenanigans. Uh, it's Father 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 McBrien and Father Mick shenanigans. He's always goofing around. Um, <laughs> so, ask later how he was how he managed to access so much classified information. Walker said that Kmart has better security than the Navy. <laughs> According to a report presented to the Office of National uh, Counterintelligence Executive in 2002, Walker is one of a handful of spies believed to have earned more than a million dollars in espionage conversation, oh. although the New York Times estimated his income was only about uh, $350,000. Which is honestly still a lot. Yeah. Like for that time period? Mm -hmm. God. So, yeah, it's a lot. It's a, a lot, lot of money. A lot of fucking money. So Theodore... Um, 
Shaq, Shaq, Le- Shaq, Shaq, Le- yes. Theodore Shaq, Le- a CIA station chief in Saigon, asserted that Walker's espionage uh, may have contributed to uh, diminished B-52 bombing strikes. That the were the four warning gleaned from Walker's espionage uh, directly affect the United States' effectiveness in Vietnam. Independent analysis of Walker's methods by uh, an American naval officer in Cold War London, Lieutenant Commander uh, David Winters, uh, led an operational instruction of technologies, which um, such as over-the-air uh, rekeying, that finally closed security gaps pr- uh, previously exploited by the Walker spiring. So this shit went from fucking a long time. Yeah. Long time. So let's talk about how you got arrested. So... John and Barbara divorced in 1976. Their marriage was marked by physically, uh, by physical abuse and alcohol. And by 1980, Barbara had begun uh, regularly abusing alcohol and was very fearful for her children. Uh, she wanted the children uh, not to become involved in the spy ring that led to a uh, constant disagreement between uh, her and John. Barbara tried several times to contact the Boston office of the FBI, but, but she either hung up or was too drunk to speak. Hmm. In November of 1984, she again uh, contacted the Boston office with a drunken confession, reported that her ex-husband spied for the Soviet Union. Uh, she did not then know that Michael had been an active participant. She later admitted that she would not have reported the spy ring if she knew, if she knew that her son was involved. The Boston office of the FBI interviewed Barbara Walker and initially uh, considered her story to be the rantings of a drunken, bitter woman trying to, quote, drop a dime on an ex-husband. <laughs> <laughs> Are you starting to know it's some sort of theme? Yeah. Yeah with, 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 yeah, with 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 the FBI and, like, you know, they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? They're you like, know? you've had alcohol, yeah. so obviously... It's pretty, it's, it's, <laughs> can't believe you. Can't believe you. So since Barbara's uh, report regarded a person who lived in Virginia, the Boston office sent it to report to the Norfolk office. Uh, when the FBI in Norfolk reviewed the report, the counterintelligence squad concluded it might be a truthful report and initiated a discreet investigation. The FBI conducted an interview of Walker's daughter, Laura, who confirmed that her father was a KGB spy and said that he tried to recruit her into, her, into his espionage ring when she was in the U.S. Army. When both Barbara Walker and Laura Walker passed polygraph examinations, uh, electronic surveillance was authorized by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court against John Walker. In May 1985, the FBI learned through the electronic sur- uh, surveillance that it was likely that John Walker would travel out of town on the weekend of May 18th and 19th in 1985. On May 19th, Walker left his house in Norfolk, Nor- Norfolk and was uh, followed uh, covertly by the FBI to the Washington, D.C. area where the surveillance was joined by personnel of the FBI's Washington field office. Later in that evening, about 8.30 p.m., he drove to a rural area in Montgomery County, Maryland, where he was seen placing a package on a wooded area near a no-hunting sign. The FBI retrieved the package and was found to have 124 pages of classified information stolen from the aircraft carrier, the USS Nimitz, where Walker's son, Michael, was assigned Ooh. Oh shit! It's getting spicy now. So spicy. John Walker was arrested during the early morning hours of May twentieth, nineteen eighty five, by a team of agents from the Norfolk and Washington FBI field offices. The FBI apprehended Walker uh, himself at a uh, motel in Montgomery County by telephoning his room number and telling him that his car had been hit in an accident. Barbara Barbara Walker was not prosecuted because of her role in disclosing the ring. Former KGB agent Victor uh, Cherkashin, however, describes in his book Spy Handler that Walker was compromised by the FBI spy um, Valery uh, Martinov, who uh, overheard officials in Moscow speaking about Walker. Oh. Uh, Michael Walker, the, the son, was arrested aboard the Nimitz, where investigators found a footlocker full of copies of classified matter. Tough. Mm. He had also t- uh, he had to be taken off ship uh, under guard to avoid getting beaten by sailors and marines. <laughs> Damn, they're gonna fucking beat his ass on the flight deck. Jesus. Um, 
Arthur uh, Walker and Jerry Whitworth were arrested by the FBI in Norfolk, uh, Virginia and Sacramento, California, respectfully. Arthur Walker was the first member of the espionage ring to go to trial. During the arrest of Arthur Walker, he was read his rights, re- repeatedly told that he needed to uh, stay silent until he could retain a lawyer, but kept admitting uh, complicity in effort to show remorse. He was then tried, convicted, and sentenced to three life sentences in a federal court. Jeez, Louise. Gone. That's so gnarly. Gone, dude. Crazy. Walker cooperated with, with somewhat with authorities, uh, enough to form a plea bargain um, that... Or reduce the sentence up for his son. He agreed to submit a unchallenged conviction and a life sentence to provide and full disclose of the details of his spying to testify against Whitworth in exchange for a, pl- a pledge from the prosecutors. The maximum sentence uh, requested for Michael was 25 years imprisonment, which uh, was later Michael's sentence. All of the members of the spy ring besides Michael Walker received life sentences for their roles of espionage. Whitworth was sentenced to 365 years in prison and fined four hundred and ten thousand dollars for his involvement. Three hundred and sixty-five years. Three hundred and sixty-five years in prison. Jeez. Whitworth was uh, incarcerated in the United States Penitentiary uh, at Water, a high security federal prison in California. Walker's older brother Arthur or Arthur uh, received three life sentences plus forty years and died in the Butner Federal uh, Correction Complex in Butner, North Carolina. In 2014, six weeks before the death of his younger brother, uh, Walker's son Michael, who had been a uh, relatively minor role in the ring, agreed to testify in exchange for a reduced sentence. Um, in February 2001, he was uh, incarcerated at FCC Butner and low security, low security pr- uh, prison, um, low, low security portion of the prison. Uh, he had he is said to suffer from diabetes and stage four throat cancer. Damn. Um, as for Walker himself, he died when he suffered from cancer and diabetes in October, on August 28th, 2014, while still in prison. He would have been eligible for parole in 2015. Oh, jeez. And we have one more in this final... Uh, yeah, we can probably do one more. All right. Let's, get, let's get it. Let's get it. You guys get it? Yeah. Uh, last on our list is probably one of my favorites. It's going to be Chicago native Robert Hassan. So Robert Hassan was born in Chicago, Illinois, to a Lutheran family who lived in the Norwood Park neighborhood. He was of Norwegian descent. His father, Howard, was a Chicago police officer. Fuck yeah. And was allegedly emotionally abusive to Hassan during his childhood. Not fuck yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, (laughs) You know, it's like Chicago police officer and he fucking hates his son. It's like, all right, maybe not as, you know. (laughs) <laughs> not, not great, not great. Um, Hassan graduated from the w- William Howard Taft High School in 1962 and attended Knox College in uh, Galesburg, Illinois, where he earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry in 1966. Excuse hmm. me while I take a sip. Excuse him. <laughs> yeah, excuse He's him. He's a thirsty boy. <laughs> Doing a lot of talking. <laughs> uh, check those hot squares and I'm shirt. What do you think? Pretty sick. Pretty tight. It's got, like, it's got like aliens and shit on it. Can't see it because of the laptop. Fuck, man. All right. <laughs> so Hassan applied uh, to crypto photography or cryptog- cryptography, um, cryptogra- cryptography, excuse me, job in the National Security Agency, also known as the NSA, uh, following his college graduation, but was turned down due to uh, budget setbacks. He enrolled in a dental school in Northwestern University, but switched focus to business after three years. Hassan received an MBA in accounting and information systems in 1971 and took a job in an accounting firm. He quit after one year and joined the Chicago Police Department as an internal affairs investigator, hmm. specializing in forensic accounting. In January 1976, uh, Hassan, uh, so Hassan, uh, uh, hand, 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 yeah, sorry. Hansen, excuse me, Hansen, uh, left the Chicago Police Force to join the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Ooh. the FBI. You guys are going to have no idea where this story is going to go. <laughs> um, because of, because this, is such a, this is such a wild story. Um, so he met his wife, Bernadette Bonnie. Uh, w- 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 Wowsk. What? Wowsk. W- Wowsk? Yeah. Oh, dude, I don't I fucking think. know. I know she's a staunch Roman Catholic. Uh, I met her while uh, attending dental school in Northwestern. 
Uh, the couple married in 1970, uh, 1968, and uh, he converted to from Lutheranism to his wife's Catholicism, which is a very cute little part of that story. They're like, they're in love, and they're like joining religions together, and that's cute. Anyway, upon becoming a special agent on January 12th, 1976, um, uh, Hassan uh, was transferred to the FBI's field office in the lovely and beautiful and tropical <laughs> Gary, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the most like fucking the terrifying. Palm city trees, in the, US. The, the beauty, it's all over the place. Um, I don't believe you. Yeah, no. In 1978, him, uh, he and his growing family of three, eventually six, uh, children relocated to New York City where the Bureau transferred him to its field office there. And the next year, uh, Hassan was transferred to the counterintelligence and given the task of compiling a database of Soviet intelligence for the FBI. Ooh. In 1979, Hassan approached the Soviet main intelligence doctorate, the GRU, GRU, and offered his services. Ooh. Big twist. Yeah. Fed going to the KGB, basically. He never indicated any political or ideological move for his action, uh, telling the FBI after he was caught that his only motivation was financial. Oh, okay. Surprise, surprise. The KJB pays better. Yeah. During his first espionage cycle, uh, Hassan provided a significant amount of information to the GRU, uh, including details of the FBI's bugging activities and lifts of suspected Soviet intelligence agents. His most important leak was that of the betrayal of Dmitry uh, Pol Polyatov, y Yakov, Polyakov, a CIA informant who had passed enormous amounts of information to the U.S. intelligence while rising to the rank of general in the Soviet Army. Oh. Uh, following the betrayal of this by the CIA, uh, Mol uh, Aldrich Ames in 1985, uh, Polyakov was arrested in 1986 and executed in 1988. Jeez. Damn. Ames was officially blamed for giving um, Pyakov's name to the Soviets, while Hassan's attempt was not revealed until his capture. Pretty wild. Yeah. So in 1981, uh, Hassan was transferred to the FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C., and relocated his family to the suburb of Vienna, uh, Virginia. His new job in the FBI's budget office gave him access to information in, in, involving many different FBI operations. This included the FBI's activities related to wiretapping and electronic surveillance, which uh, Hassan's, was were Hassan's responsibility. Uh, he became known in the FBI as an expert on computers. That's pretty neat. You said he moved to Vienna? Virginia? <laughs> yeah, Virginia. Yeah. I hear they have really good sausages there. <laughs> When the moon hits your <laughs> eye like a big pizza pie, that's some more. <laughs> Pretty proud of yourself it was, on that it one. It was a bad joke, but yeah, I wanted to say it, so I said it. That was a Marty joke. <laughs> it was. It was a Marty joke. I was surprised you didn't say anything about yeah, it. Yeah, I was getting close. You beat me to it. <laughs> that's, how, that's how I feel about that. <laughs> so... And three years later, Hassan transferred to the FBI's Soviet... Uh, analytical unit responsible for studying, identifying, and capturing Soviet spies and intelligence operatives in the United States. Uh, Hansen's uh, section uh, evaluated uh, Soviet agents who volunteered to give up intelligence to determine whether or not they had were genuine or redoubled agents. In 1985, uh, Hansen uh, was again transferred to the FBI's field office in New York City, where he continued to work in counterintelligence against Soviets. After the transfer, while on a business, uh, uh, business visit back to Washington, he resumed his espionage career. Oh. Surprise, surprise. So on October 1st, 1985, uh, he sent an anonymous letter to the KGB offering his services and asking for $100,000 in cash, equivalent to $270,000 in modern day. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of money. In the letter, he gave the names of three KGB agents secretly working for the FBI, Boris uh, Yuzgin, uh, Valery uh, Murinov, and Sergei uh, Mordorin. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Bless you. Although uh, uh, Hansen um, Hansen was uh, unaware of it, uh, Ames had already exposed all three agents a year earlier. 
um, or so earlier that year. Um, uh, Yusin had returned to Moscow in 1982 and had been the subject uh, to an intensive investigation by the KGB during uh, due to have lost a concealed camera in the Soviet consulate in San Francisco, but he was not arrested until being exposed by Ames and uh, Hansen. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Martinov and uh, Motorin were recalled to Moscow, but they arrested, charged, tried, and convicted of espionage against the, uh, the Soviet government. Um, they were both executed via gunshot in the back of the head. God oh, damn. Shit. Guy in the house. Three, three, great execution. Three bodies on this guy already. Uh, Yusin was in prison for six years before he was released by a general amnesty uh, to political prisoners and subsequently immigrated to the U.S. <laughs> Uh, because the FBI blamed Ames for the leak, uh, Hansen um, was neither suspected nor investigated. Oh. And oct- the October 1st letter began a long active espionage period for Hansen. Oh. Uh, Hansen was, um, I hope I'm saying his name, it's H A N S S E N. I'm fairly Hansen. certain yeah. it's just Hansen, yeah. but with two S's. Yeah. Hansen was recalled yet again to Washington, D.C. in 1987. He was tasked with studying all known and rumored rumored, uh, penetrations of the FBI to find the man who had betrayed uh, Martinov, Motrin, as a Martinov and uh, Motorin. This meant, in effect, he was charged with searching for himself. (laughs) 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 Which which is really funny. It's, It's one of my favorite fucking parts of this. Um... Hansen ensured that he did not reveal himself with this study, but in addition, he gave the entire uh, study, including the list of Soviets who had um, contacted uh, the FBI about the FBI's moles to the KGB in 1988. That same year, Hansen, according to the government report, committed a serious security a serious security breach by revealing secret information to Soviet defector during a de- debriefing. The agents working for him reported this breach to a supervisor, but no action was taken. Oh. Yeah. In 1989, Hansen compromised the FBI investigation of Felix Block, a Department of State official who was suspected of espionage. Hansen warned the KGB that Block was being investigated, causing the KGB to end contact with him abruptly. The FBI could not provide any uh, good evidence as a result. Block was never charged with a crime, although the State Department later determined his employ- uh, employment and denied, uh, sorry, terminated his employment and denied his pension. Oh. The failure of Block's investigation, the FBI investigation of how the KGB learned of the, uh, that they were investigating Block, caused the mole hunt that eventually resulted in the arrest of Hansen. Later that year, Hansen gave an extensive information about the U.S. planning for a measurement and significant, uh, uh, sorry, measurement and signature intelligence. Um, a general term for intelligence collected by a variety of electronic means such as radar, spy satellites, and a signal uh, and signal intercepts. When the Soviets began constructing on a new embassy during 1977, the FBI dug a tunnel beneath their decoding room, which is fucking pretty cr- crazy. <laughs> they're just um, down there with shovels. like. Yeah, they're like, we, we, I think we put the break room on this side. And you're just like... <laughs> and they're like... Is there somebody? Is there somebody uh, underneath the ground trying to make a tunnel? No. Absolutely, no. absolutely, absolutely no. not. No, we're not under here. <laughs> Stop laughing! Shut the fuck up, dude! Right? Shut up. No, we're just another Russian mole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> the FBI planned to use it for eavesdropping, but never did uh, for fear of being caught. Uh, Hansen's disclosed this information to the Soviets in September 1989 and received $55,000 payment on the next month, equivalent to $130,000. Wow. On two occasions, Hansen gave the Soviets a complete list of American double agents. Oh, shit. Damn. Crazy, crazy. In 1990, Hansen's brother-in-law, Mark, uh, was that, was it Wok? Wok? Wow. Dude, I don't know. That's a fucking W A W A U C K. That's a crazy last name. I don't know. It's whack. Um, who uh, also was an FBI employee recommended to the FBI that Hansen should be investigated for espionage because of his sister. Hansen's wife had told uh, her sister, uh, Janine uh, Beglis, that uh, she had found a pile of cash on her dresser in Hansen's house. Bonnie previously told her brother that Hansen once talked about retiring to, uh, in Poland. Uh, then a part of the Eastern Bloc. 
Uh, Wuak also knew that the FBI was hunting for a mole and spoke to his supervisor, who again, took no action. Of course. Yeah. Why would they? Exactly. When the USSR disbanded in December 1991, Hassan possibly worried that he could be exposed during the ensuing political upheaval and communications with his handlers for a time. The following year, after the Russian Federation uh, resumed, uh, assumed control of the defunct Soviet agent, uh, spy agencies, Hassan made a risky approach to the GRU, with whom he had not been in contact in 10 months. He went to the Russian embassy in person and physically approached a GRU officer in a parking garage. Hassan carried a package of documents to identify himself by his Soviet, Soviet codename, uh, Ramon Garcia. Oh, <laughs> And uh, in case you're wondering, this guy is very pale, very white guy. Um, he's like, I'm Ramon Garcia. And you're like, you're definitely like John Waters, bro. <laughs> um, the, and described himself as a uh, disaffected FBI agent who was offering his services as a spy. The Russian, Russian officer who uh, evidently did not recognize the code name drove away. <laughs> <laughs> of course. He's just like, mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> just dries off. The Russians then filed an official uh, protest to the U.S. State Department, believing Hassan to be a triple agent. Despite having shown his face and disclosing his code name and revealing his FBI affiliation, Hassan escaped arrest when the FBI's investigation into the incident did not uh, advance. FBI is doing great. They're doing great. They're doing some great work out there. Yeah, they're having a, they're having a great time. Hansen uh, continued to take risks in 1993 when he hacked into the computer of a fellow FBI agent, Ray Mislock, uh, printed out classified document from Mislock's computer, and took the document to, to Mislock saying, y you don't believe me that the system was insecure. <laughs> <laughs> so he just walks up and he's like, hey, look at that, stupid. Hey, I got your fucking, got your documents. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to be and they spit and they pee on him. <laughs> um, Hansen's superiors were not amused and began an investigation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is like, th this is literally, literally the, well, the main reason why he was caught is because he was fucking around. In the end, officials believed his claim was merely demonstrating flaws in the FBI's security system. Miss Locke has since theorized that Hansen probably went into his computer to see if his uh, superiors were investigating him for espionage and invented the document story to cover his tracks. Probably. Probably. And in 1994, Hansen expressed an interest in the transfer to the new National Counterintelligence Office, which uh, coordinated with counterintelligence activities. Uh, when told that he would have to take a lie detector test to join, Hansen changed his mind. Obviously. Three years later, con uh, convicted FBI mole Ed uh, Earl Edwin Pitts told FBI that he suspected Hansen due to the mislock incident. Pitts was the second agent to mention Hansen by name as a possible mole, but superiors were not convinced and uh, no action was taken. Of course. Uh, IT personnel from the National Security Division, IIS unit, were sent to investigate Hansen's desktop computer after a, a reported failure. NSD chief uh, Johnny Sullivan ordered the computer impounded after it seemed to have been tampered with. A digital investigation found that an attempted uh, hacking had occurred using a password cracking system installed by Hansen, which caused a security alert and locked up. After a confirm, uh, confirmation by the FBI CART unit, Sullivan fired a, filed a report to the Office of Professional Responsibility requesting the further investigation of Hansen's uh, attempted hack. Hansen claimed that he was trying to connect to a color uh, printer uh, to his computer, but needed a password cracker to uh, bypass the administration password. The FBI believed his story, and Hansen was merely given a warning. They believed they, it? They, <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, you know that hack that was definitely placed on there by me? I was trying to connect a printer. And they're like, <laughs> it, happens all, Crazy. It, happens, it happens all the time. Yeah, no, this is actually the third time this week. <laughs> like, yeah, we get it. We totally understand. They believed it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So during the same period, Hansen's uh, searched the FBI's internal computer uh, case record to see if he was being investigated. 
he was indiscreet and uh, he was uh, indiscreet enough to type his name into the FBI search engines, finding nothing. Hansen decided to resume his spy career after eight years without contact uh, with the Russians. He established contact with the SVR, the successor to the KGB, uh, during the autumn of 1999. He continued to perform an incriminating searches of the FBI files for his name and address. But it all has to come to an end at some point, right? Yeah. So the existence of two Russian moles working the U.S. Uh, security and intelligence established simultaneously aims at the CIA, enhancing the FBI, complicated the counterintelligence efforts during the 1990s. Ames was arrested in 1994. His exposure explained many of the asset uh, losses U.S. intelligence suffered during the 1980s, including the arrest and act, uh, execution of Martinov and Motorin. However, two cases, the Blotch investigation and the embassy tunnel, remained unsolved. Ames had been stationed in Rome at the time of the Block investigation and could not have known about the case or, nor the tunnel in the embassy as he did not work for the FBI. The FBI and the CIA formed a joint mole hunting team in 1994 to find the suspected second intelligence leak. They created a list of all agents known to have access to the case that were that were compromised. The FBI's code name for the suspect uh, suspected spy was Gray Suit. Some promising uh, suspects were cleared. The mole hunt found other uh, uh, penetrations, such as CSA officer Harold James uh, Nicholson. However, Hansen escaped. Uh, notice, likely because these efforts uh, concentrate on FBI agents rather than CIA agents. Surprise, surprise. By 1998, the CIA, uh, sorry, the FBI criminal profiling tech, uh, techniques, the um, so using pro criminal profiling te techniques, the pursuers suspected an innocent man, Brian Kelly, a CIA operative uh, involved in the Block investigation. A bloach. Is it a Block or bloach? I believe it's Block. Uh, might be Bloch, whatever. Oh. It's out there. The CIA and the FBI searched his house, tapped his telephone, surveilled him, uh, following him and his family everywhere. In November 1998, they had a man with a foreign accent come to Kelly's door, warn him that the FBI knew he was a spy, and tell him to show up at a metro station the next few days to escape. Kelly instead reported the incident to the FBI. In 1999, uh, the FBI even interrogated Kelly and his um, ex-wife, two sisters, and three children, all denying everything. He was eventually placed on administrative leave where he remained falsely accused until after Hansen was arrested. So, so I know that when it says that they had a man with a foreign accent, uh, that it was probably a man with a Russian accent. Yeah. Well, but I, what if it was just like... A French accent, or like. Oh, come on. <laughs> I am going to tell you that the FBI is watching you, and they're going to take you. You must meet in the metro station. Like. <laughs> a man in a foreign Midwestern accent showed up. <laughs> oh, hey there, bud. Yeah, they said something about you're going to going to prison for the rest of your life unless you meet me at the metro station. Okay. No rush, though. All right. See you tomorrow. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, like I know it was probably a man with a Russian accent, but I also know that the FBI. Uh, in this story is not very smart. Not very, very smart. So, like, if we find someone with a close enough accent, I think we can fool him. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I took six years of improv. I know what to do. <laughs> so, the FBI investigators um, later made progress during the operation where they paid a disaffected Russian intelligence officer to deliver information on moles. They paid $7 million to KGB agent Alexander uh Shin Black Blackoff, fucking whatever, who had access to file on B, quote B. While it did not contain uh, Hassan's name, uh, uh, Hansen's name, among uh, the information was an audio tape of July 21st, 1986, a uh, conversation between B and KGB agent Alexander uh, Fefilov. Uh, the FBI agent Michael, oh, dude, man, what the fuck is on one of these names? Michael. Wog Wog's pack. Wog's pack. <laughs> Wog's pack. Sure. Um, thought that the voice was familiar, but could not remember who it was. Rifling through the rest of the files, he found notes of the mole using uh, a quote from George S. Patton's speech uh, to the Third Army about the purple pissing Japanese. Real thing, apparently. The FBI analysis Bob King remembered ha uh, Hansen's uh, using the same quote. Walks pack listened to the tape again and recognized the voice belonging to Hansen. Oh, oh shit. 
With the mole finally being identified, locations and dates and cases were matched to Hansen's activities during the period. Two fingerprints were connected, collected from a trash bag in the file and were analyzed and proved to be Hansen's. Mm -hmm. Oh, shit. It's all coming down now. House of Cards, baby. The FBI surveilled Hansen and soon discovered he was again in contact with the Russians. To bring him back to FBI headquarters, where they can be closely monitored and keep him away from sensitive data, they promoted him in December of 2000. They gave him a new job, supervising FBI computer security. In January 2001, Hansen was given an office and an assistant, Eric O'Neill, who in reality was a young FBI surveillance specialist who had been assigned to watch Hansen. Oh, oh shit. Yep. Getting, getting crossed. So O'Neill uh, ascertained that Hansen was a uh, Palm 3 PDA uh, to store his information, was using a Palm 3 PDA to uh, store his information. Uh, when the movement arrived, from the moment it arrived that O'Neill was able to briefly obtain Hansen's PDA, the agents downloaded and decoded its encrypted contents. The FBI had uh, then had obtained their deci deci decisive evidence. Oh. Mm-hmm. During the final days of the FBI, Hansen began to suspect something was wrong. In early 2001, uh, February 2001, he uh, asked his friend at the computer technology company for a job. He believed that he heard noises on the, his car radio and indicated that it was bugged. Although the FBI was later unable to reproduce the noises Hansen claimed to have heard. Uh, in the last letter he wrote to the Russians, which was found by the FBI, when he was arrested, Hansen said that he had been promoted to quote a quote do nothing job outside the regular access is information and that quote something has aroused the sleeping tiger oh yeah I'm like oh, i'm getting aroused i'm sleeping <laughs> i'm a sleeping tiger i'm getting aroused <laughs> oh okay anyway. however hansen's suspicions did not stop him from making one more dead drop Oh. Of course. After leaving a friend in an airport on February 18, 2001, Hansen drove to Virginia's Foxstone Park, placed a white piece of tape on a park sign, which was a sign uh, signal to Russian contacts. There was information at the site of a dead drop. Um, he then was followed. He then followed his usual routine, taking a, uh, a package consisting of a sealed garbage bag of classified material and taping it to the bottom side of a wooden footbridge over a creek. When the FBI agents observed this incriminating act, they rushed to, in to arrest Hansen. Oh. Upon being arrested, Hansen said, "What took you so long?" <laughs> The FBI waited two more days to see if any Hansen SVR handlers would show up at Foxstone Park. When they failed to appear, the United States Justice Department announced the arrest on February 20th. Huh. Yeah. Finally got him. He's finally in cuffs. I mean, they could have found him a lot earlier if they'd just investigated some of the claims. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, represented by uh, Washington, D.C. lawyer uh, uh, Plato... Uh, Catcheris, uh, Hansen negotiated a plea bargain that enabled him to avoid the death penalty in exchange for cooperating with authorities. On July 6, 2001, he pleaded to 13 counts of espionage, one count of attempted espionage, and one count of conspiracy to commit espionage in the United States District Court of Eastern District of Virginia. On May 10th, 2002, Hansen was sentenced to 15 consecutive sentences of life in prison Jesus. without the possibility of parole. He said, quote, I apologize for my behavior. I am shamed by it. Hansen told the U.S. District Attorney Judge Claude Hilton, quote, I have opened the door for calam uh, sorry, uh, cl for calamity mm -hmm. uh, against my total uh, innocent wife and children. I've hurt them. So I've hurt so many deeply. Uh, Hansen was a federal uh, was placed in Federal Bureau uh, prisons prisoner. Uh, and from July 17, 2002, until his death, he served a sentence at ADX Florence, a federal supermax prison near Florence, Colorado, and was in solitary confinement 23 hours Jesus a day. Jesus Christ. 23 hours a day. So imagine, he went, in, he went in there in 2002, okay? Just remember that. Yeah. July 17, 2002. Just remember right. that. Remember that date, okay? So, um... I'm going to kind of talk just briefly about his modus operandi and his personal life real quick. Um, so Hassan never told the KGB or the GR of his identity, refused to meet them personally, except for the uh, abortive um, 
In 1993, contacted the Russian embassy parking lot. The FBI believes the Russians never knew the name of the source, going by the alias uh, uh, Raymond or Raymond Garcia. Hansen exchanged the intelligence payments uh, through an old-fashioned dead drop system, which he used, which he and the KGB handles left uh, handlers left packages in public or uh, undestructive. Uh, unobstructed places. He refused um, to use dead drop sites that his handler, uh, Victor Ch- uh, Chachetskin, uh, suggested and instead he used his own. He designated a code uh, to be used when the dates were exchanged. Uh, six was to be added to the month, day, and the time of the designated drop. So that, for example, the drop was set for January 6th at 1 p.m. That, that would be written as July 12th, 7 p.m. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So despite these efforts at caution and security, Hansen uh, could sometimes be called reckless. He once said in a letter to the KGB that could be uh, emulate the management style of mayor of Chicago, Richard J. Uh, Dale, um, a comment that could easily lead an investigator to people look at people from Chicago. Surprising. Hansen uh, took the risk of recommending to his handlers that they should try recruiting his closest friend, the Colonel of the United States Army. As for his personal life, and according to USA Today, there were uh, those who knew Hansen's, uh, knew the Hansons described them as a close family. They attended mass weekly and a very active, um, and very active uh, opus die. Uh, Hansen's three sons attended the Heights School and and Potomac, uh, Potomac. Uh, sorry, I think it's. P- P- Potomac. Potomac, yeah. Potomac, Maryland. Uh, uh, and all three boys uh, were in a, uh, preparatory school. His three daughters att- attended Oak, uh, Oak Crest High School for girls in Vienna, Virginia, an independent Roman Catholic school. Both schools uh, were associated with the Opus Dei. Uh, Hans's wife, Bonnie, retired from teaching in uh, 2020. Uh, a priest at the Ocris said that Hansen uh, had regularly attended at 6.30 a.m. daily mass f- for over a decade. Um, the member of the church, C. John uh, McClotsky, oh, C. John McClotsky uh, said that uh, he also occasionally attended the daily uh, noontime mass at the Catholic Information Center in downtown Washington, D.C. After being in prison, Hansen claimed that he periodically uh, admitted his espionage to the priest and confession. He urged that the fellow Catholics in the FBI um, to attend mass more often and denounce the Russian as Russians as godless, even though he had been spying for them. At Hansen's suggestion, uh, and without the wife's uh, knowledge, a uh, friend named Jack uh, Hauscher, um a retired army officer would sometimes watch the Hansons have uh, sex through the bedroom window. Hansen uh, then began to videotape his sexual encounters uh, secretly and shared the videotapes with Hauschner. Um, later, he hid the video camera in the bedroom connected with the via closed circuit television line so the Hauschner could observe the Hansons from his guest bedroom. He explicitly described the sexual details of his marriage on the internet and chat rooms, giving information of sufficient uh, for those who knew them to recognize the couple. Ew. Uh, Hanson <laughs> frequently visited uh, D.C. strip clubs and spent a great deal of time in Washington stripper na- with, sorry, with a Washington stripper named Priscilla Sue uh, Gali. Uh, she went with Hanson on visits to Hong Kong and the FBI training facility in Quantico, Virginia. Hanson gave her money, jewels, and used Mercedes Benz, but ended, ended contact with her before his arrest, which began abusing drugs and doing sex work. Uh, Gali claims that although she offered sex with him, uh, offered to have sex with him, Hanson declined, saying that he was going to convert her to Catholicism. What? what? Which is pretty wild. So, like I said before, remember that date, you know, where I said July 7th, you know, 2020, uh, 2002. Yeah. When he went into prison, right? And he went into that prison in, uh, you know, in Colorado. Well, alas, this story comes to an end on June 5th, 2023. Damn. Hanson was found unresponsive in his prison cell. He was pronounced dead after several unsuccessful efforts to revive him. He was 79 years old, and reports suspect that he died of natural causes. Oh, shit. Taking all of their secrets he has of the Russians to his grave. Well, he just crazy. died a few weeks ago. Two weeks, a couple weeks ago. Isn't yeah. that crazy? That is crazy. That is insane. Yeah. Well, 
Episode 80, baby. It's almost two fucking hours of spies and all this shit. It's episode 80. Thank you so much for being with us for all 80 episodes. If you've listened to every single episode, give you a big old kiss on the lips. Mwah. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I should do something crazy. What no. can I do? <laughs> you don't have to Shit do on the desk. No. Take a bite out of this candle. No. Cover myself in... Hold on. Cover, cover myself in... in my car? No. What, what should I do, Marty? <laughs> I was gonna uh, say. Eat the can. No. I can't do that. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Episode 80. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you can do, but... Definitely not any of the things that you just suggested. Episode 80, you fuckers. <laughs> hey. Thank you so much for joining us for every single episode. If you have been, if you're new listening, reach five stars and listening apps, all that fun stuff. We're so close to episode 100. And we got something really fun planned for episode 100. It's going to be really fucking cool. It's going to yeah. be really exciting. Um,. If you guys want to see us do some like Twitch shows and things like that, let us know. We'll do some Twitch live shows. Um, I mean, there's so many, so much goddamn alien footage and ghost footage out there that we can definitely cover some of that. Um, but if uh, you guys are interested in that, let us know and we'll get that ball rolling. Um, in the meantime, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at, at HGO Podcast and Haunts, Graves, and Omens. What, you want to you email us, tell us a crazy story. Were you a Russian spy? Were you a spy for the United States? Were you a ghost? Did you see ghosts? Did you see aliens? Did you see an alien? Hmm? You, you, you give fellatio to Bigfoot? I don't know. What? <laughs> Whatever yeah. happened, email us HGO, HGO Podcast at gmail.com. If you want to follow me directly on Instagram, feel free to do so at I Hunt the Haunted. You can also find me on Twitch under the same handle, twitch.tv slash I Hunt the Haunted. And go check out our other show, The Doc. It's fine. <laughs> It's gonna go on for so long. <laughs> you can follow. <laughs> you can go check out the dog. I meant to do the yeehaw one. <laughs> find it. Find it real quick. Yeehaw. There it is. <laughs> go check out the doc. We're starting recording episodes again. We're gonna really drop a new episode here very, very soon. Like very soon. Um, and it's probably one of the funniest uh, uh, episodes we've done in a minute. Um, other than that, pass it off to Tay. Yeah. Uh, God damn it. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at uh, Lunar Thrill. That's really the only social media I got and use. Martine. Follow me on Instagram at Ghetto Feather. Let's go, baby. <laughs> All right. Remember. I'm for real, for real. Let's see. Oh. <laughs> Stop speaking, Jesse. Whoa. Stay spooky. Stay haunted. And I'm a fucking spy. <laughs> <Under what? laughs> oh my god. Oh. <laughs> you are covered in. Yeah! Let's go. <laughs> See you next week, fuckers. <laughs> <laughs>